Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mick Gooder. I'm the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Um, welcome to our place at the Human Rights Commission. Um, thank you all for coming. I think we're going to have a great talk this afternoon by Alan and Patty, dear friends of mine uh, from Canada. Uh, we've done a lot of work together. Um, but as, before I start, I, I acknowledge we sit on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and, and I pay my respects to their elders who are with us today, their elders who have passed and their elders to yet emerge. I'm a Gungaloo man from central Queensland. Uh, my countryman who's going to talk next, Shane Houston, is also a Gungaloo man. It looks like the Queensland has taken over the front branch here. Um, so, uh, but I'd also um, uh, send uh, greetings to the local people from my people in central Queensland and, and make a commitment to honour their, their fight for their culture and their country, but also to commit to not touching or making sure their culture and their country stays in the same condition it was when I arrived here. So I am not in, allowed to interfere with anything. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of really important people in the room. Uh, Jackie Huggins, uh, uh, another Queenslander who who is uh, uh, just been elected as our co-chair of the National Congress of First Peoples. Um, in the back, uh, Jeff Scott, uh, who is the CEO of the Congress of First Peoples. Um, uh, my great friend Shireen Malamu, uh, who uh, worked with me in in Social Security, where I actually started my public service career back in the 80s in, in Queensland. So Shireen and I have been down a few burnt gullies. And, and if I could tell you a story about Shireen, um, Shireen doesn't have anything holes barred ringing ministers up. And she used to ring the minister up all the time as a member of Social Security. And, uh, and the regional manager rang and said, I've got to counsel Shireen about that. You know, she can't do that because she's a public servant. And of course, the next phone call from Shireen was back to the minister saying, they're telling me I can't talk to you anymore. And he rang me again, I said, just let it go. <laughs> so Shireen's been a great advocate and it's great that you've come here tonight, uh, this afternoon, Shireen. Before I start, uh, before we start, uh, and to contextualise, I think, the speech and the presentation a bit, I'd just like to um, uh, acknowledge what's happening in Perth this week. Uh, a young woman, Miss Jew, died a couple of years ago in custody. Uh, she was 22 years old. She was put in jail because she had a bit over $3,000 in outstanding fines. Uh, we're learning that she was subject to domestic violence. Uh, the police system let her down. Uh, she was treated as her mother, we called early this week on the first day of the um, um, inquest over over there that she was treated like a kangaroo when they cut kangaroos around. Um, taken to the hospital, sent back twice from the hospital, everything was okay, and then died. So we're looking at the whole three areas here, domestic violence, yet to be proved, but my information from WA is pretty certain on that. A young woman, 22 years old, beaten, put in jail for not paying fines, sent to a hospital twice, yet we still have a death in custody. So can I just um, pay my respects to the Jew family, what they're going through over there? And I think today being White Ribbon Day, is it's appropriate that we acknowledge Miss Jew and her family. Having done that, um, uh, setting a very sombre note, but I think what you're going to hear today is not only the sombre stuff, but some really great work being done in Canada, how do we actually fix some of this? And together with the Canadians and ourselves, we intend to do a fair bit of work together. But I'd li really like to introduce my countryman, Shane Houston. Shane um, is a scholar. He, he uh, I was in WA when he completed his PhD in economics. Um, um, he's a Gungaloo man. Um, but very importantly, um, uh, he is, holds the highest position, I think, Shane, in, in the university 
network here in Australia. He's our first Deputy Vice-Chancellor. and He's a Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Sydney University. So, Shane. Thank you, Mick. Um, thank you, Mick. Um, I'm going to rechristen the front row here, the Pineapple, uh, Pineapple Mafia Row, right? Um, <laughs> to all these Queenslanders. Um, thank you, Mick. I too would like to acknowledge Gadigal people. And it's, and it's important just to pause for a moment and think about that because too often people think about acknowledgements of the country as a perfunctory event, something that just happens because it's on the order of proceedings. It's not. The welcome to country or acknowledgement to country is something that's been part of Aboriginal tradition for tens of thousands of years. Movement across country always involved asking. People would come from their country to a border, for example, here in, in, in Sydney, the difference between Gadigal people and Wongal people the next mob going that way, going to the southwest, was roughly the Mizzidon Road Ridge, roughly. And people would, would approach the border, they would announce their, uh, their approach, and then they would sit and wait. And they would wait until the owners of the country to, into which they wanted to travel would come and invite them in. So the, the welcome to country or acknowledgement of country isn't just something that's politically correct. It's the continuing element, it's a continuing element of our culture across tens of thousands of years. And here in Sydney, it's no less important than it is in anywhere else in the country. Most people don't realise that George Street isn't a road made by the colony, that the Pacific Highway wasn't made by the Department of Main Roads here in New South Wales, the Botany Road, the Parramatta Road. These were not all roads constructed by the colony. These are tracks created by Aboriginal people over tens of thousands of years. So next time you walk down George Street, as many of you might in the next couple of days, the distance between you and the spirit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose country we walk on is as thick as the bitumen. So the distance, even in a city like Sydney, is only that far, that deep. So acknowledgements are important. I get the pleasure of introducing Paddy and Alan. Um, and, but before I do that, I'd like just to pause for a moment and, and emphasise the point that Mick made about today being White Ribbon Day. There are good reasons why all of us men and women need to take the opportunity to stand and, and remember and to commit to action that reduces violence against women. It's not just for women, it's for our children, it's for our men, it's for our families and our communities. It's something we all need to do. Patty and Alan um, have a long-standing CV, and I'm just going to pick a couple of things out from the printed bio, and then I'll talk a bit more about them. But Alan, Dr. Alan Benson is the Chief Executive Officer of Dating Counselling Services of Alberta, Alberta, based in Edmonton, but he's also Chief Executive Officer of Bearport Communications Limited. He has spearheaded the development of a whole range of initiatives across Canada. They have included restorative justice, housing, counselling services, corrections, health services, housing services, the list goes on and on and on. The list of awards and uh, recognition that he has received over the years is as long as the list of uh, projects that he has been involved in and that he has shown leadership in. Not the least being a Doctor of Laws from the University of Alberta, um, the Margaret Mead Award, which is the International Community of Corrections Association's highest honour. He has the Alberta Centennial Medal, the Alberta Aboriginal Role Model Award in Justice, and it goes on and on and on. He is the chair of the Alberta Family Violence Death Review Committee, a task which I think people who take on those roles need to be acknowledged because there is an enormous amount of pain involved in that process and it takes real strength of leadership to stand up. And there are many other things that Alan has done. Patty, Dr. Patty Labo Kane, uh, is a scholar of some note. She has held the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Scholarship and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Doctoral Fellowship in Canada. She's also worked with the Native Counseling Services for about 20 years. I know she looks about 16, um, but <laughs> um, but she recently, um, she completed her PhD, a Métis woman who completed her PhD in human ecology, focusing on Aboriginal family and community resistance. She is a producer in Bearport Productions. She is a, an author, having produced a, 
uh, graphic novel which was on the best-selling list in North America for a length of time and if you get a chance to look at it grab it it's it's incredibly provocative and I think people look forward to the second novel in the not too distant future that's the sort of stuff that's included on the on the formal bio but I think it's important just to, to talk particularly about these two for a second leadership is something that is hard to do um, it's hard in the best of circumstances leadership for good is even a greater challenge. Leadership for good in an intercultural setting that is replete with doubts, confusion, fears, history, collective memories that are challenging is even more difficult. Both Patty and Alan have stepped into this leadership for good in that complex space and have stood firm for about 20 years. I think their talk today um, will enthrall us all, but I think most importantly, it's going to provoke us to think. And I think that means we might then have the courage to act. Can I introduce Dr. Patty, ben, uh, Patty Labacane Benson and Dr. Alan Benson. Uh, thank you very much, Shane and Nick. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and we too from our ancestors want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and uh, I also want to acknowledge some of the people who I've met and known over the years and uh, Jeff it's a pleasure to see you it's been a long time uh, it truly is a pleasure to be here I especially want to acknowledge the white ribbon campaign um, we just uh, two weeks ago, um, released our first annual report to the legislature on our family violence death review uh, on the white on our white ribbon campaign um, day. So uh, it's uh, appropriate that we're talking about this issue today. And uh, as a Treaty Six First Nations Cree man, um, I want to say that um, traveling. Uh, to New Zealand for the International Healing of Spirits Conference and being here today is a real pleasure and an opportunity to sit with some of the elders um, makes us feel at home. So thank you. Uh, Patty, do you want to introduce yourself and then? Okay. So I'm going to give you a, a bit of a, I guess, a rundown of our organization, real brief history. We uh, are the longest standing First Nations, Métis, Inuit, uh, organization and the largest uh, Aboriginal social justice agency in Canada and we have been providing services for 45 years we started off with the uh, legal service or court worker program and quickly moved into family law and youth law and started to I guess begin to understand that we needed to really start to deal with the issues rather than just the legal representation and so our agency quickly uh, switch gears and moved into what we thought was healing at that time. Um, so rehabilitation, wellness, and over the years um, we have continued to change and grow as an organization. And I have to say that my own experience, and I, I was affiliated with the organization for 36 years, and my own experience um, was really at the beginning of the organization in the, in the time when we were providing the basic fundamental services to represent our people. And we thought we were doing some rehabilitation work. Uh, looking back, we were nowhere near as effective as we certainly are now. And part of that experience, I lend to my experience here in Australia. Um, and since 1985, had the privilege of meeting and working and exchanging with many different people throughout Australia. And it wasn't until I came to Australia and spent a couple of years here working with Aboriginal Affairs and working in the communities and beginning to have a much clearer view of how closely re related we are with our issues uh, as a country and as Aboriginal people. And it wasn't until that time that I realized that we had a lot of work to do back home. And so when I went back and had the opportunity uh, to take over the organization, I realized that it was going to be a major task because change isn't easy. 
and I not only had to uh, get a, get my board on on board and the government and bring the thinking around to a different language, a language I began to understand clearer while I was here. And so that journey from 1996 till now has been a change journey. And I, I, I started to refer to the organization when we were 30 years old as a 30 year old man, 30 year old woman, um, getting some education, getting some experience, but wanting to be up at the table to make sure that our voice is heard because we think we have some really good ideas. Um, and at 35 and 40, our maturity started to happen and we actually started to have some good ideas and started to have some really good experiences and started to reflect on what we were doing and what we, what we were succeeding in and what our challenges were. At 45 years, I believe we're at that stage where we're doing some pretty good reflection and analyzing how well we're doing and managing our family a little differently and having some experiences. So I don't think we're anywhere near perfect, um, but I do think we're at that stage now where we have some good reflection, um, have a strong family network as an organization and a healthy family network because of those experiences. And that's where I think we are as an organization. Um, and I don't think of, we're here to tell you that we have everything right. We certainly don't. We have been working really hard at building relationships. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And that journey um, started with our elders. In going back to Canada, I recognized that the only way we were going to get it right is if we acknowledge that the answers to our problems came from our community and no one else could solve the problem. And I continue to refer to it as the Indian problem. No one can, can solve the Indian problem but us. And once I acknowledged that and convinced our board and our management and our staff and started to convince our partners, the government, private sector, community leaders, we started to acknowledge that we really need to go to our elders, our, our deep thinkers, our deep spiritual leaders and have them guide us and have these deep conversations that need to be happening in, in, and that needs to happen in our community. And I'd like to acknowledge these elders. The two on the top left and bottom have recently passed. Um, <clears throat> these particular elders spent a lot of time with us to better understand the Cree teachings. And taking those teachings, we were able to then go to the Blackfeet, the Dene, the Lakota and Dakota Sioux, and be able to spend time with them to better understand uh, the relationship that we needed to develop in our community in order to make change. And as we're going through the presentation, Patty will talk about the model. Um, so I, I wanna make, make it clear that going back to Canada was a real challenge because I, I took the organization from primarily a Christian influenced organization and turned it right around to a traditionally influenced organization. And uh, it was a long journey. But that journey began here, and I want to acknowledge and thank the people in Australia who have given me that opportunity to learn while I was here. So um, I'm going to, uh, I'm the geek, so I'm going to put the model into perspective. I'll talk a little bit about the research that we did and talk a bit about Canadian history and how this influenced the model that underlies all of the work that we do at NCSA. So from the, um, in this research project that started in 2007 with those four beautiful Cree elders expanding to our Lakota Nakota, Dene, um, Blackfoot and Métis elders, um, they taught us a lot about all of the very distinct cultural, uh, ritual, family organization, ways of being that each of these nations have. Underneath it all, they also talked about this interconnected worldview, and I think that interconnected worldview probably binds us to the traditional people on this land as well. And so um, I, we got permission from those elders to represent it in this way. These are not teachings. These are not the deep, beautiful, philosophical teachings. This is the way that I was given permission to organize it so that we could build uh, interventions on, on these teachings. 
and take these very traditional ancient teachings and propel them forward into current day services and ways of being. And so this, um, this spiral represents our interconnectedness. You know, I'm not the first person to do that. There are petroglyphs and caves across Canada with spiral representations talking about our interconnectedness. I had a 3D animator, mine's a little bit more cool maybe, but um, that spiral talks about how the individual, the family, the clan, the nation, the natural world and the spirit world are all interconnected. That every rung is equal and the spaces in between are important, it stands up whole and healthy and it's moving because our relationships are constantly changing. It's a dynamic idea. So, um, you know, when I was a, a toddler, I had one relationship with my mother. When I turned 13, for example, that relationship changed, probably for the worse. When I was 23 and I learned a few things and some ideas, that my relationship with my mom changed again. When I had a child when I was 32, it transformed completely. Absolutely. I realized I knew nothing and I needed my mom more than ever. And now that my mom is 75, that relationship has changed again. I have been in relationship with my mom the whole way through. But if she and I hadn't constantly re-engaged and worked on our relationship, we probably wouldn't be talking right now. And so that spiral is moving to remind us that we have to constantly work on all of our relationships. But the thing about an interconnected worldview is that it privileges relationships. Nothing is more important in our life than our relationships. No action I can take should ever jeopardize that. Every action I take should maintain, strengthen, and reaffirm my relationships to every living thing. And from a Cree, a Cree worldview, everything's alive. The rock has spirit, the water has spirit, the plants and animal have spirit, and I have to maintain that relationship. Oops. So. Yeah, great. There we go. So the Cree believe, and this, these are teachings that the elders gave us, that we all have a special and sacred relationship with the Creator. And as a result, the Creator gave us sacred gifts. The first set of gifts are our physical gifts. Everything we need to survive was provided to us by the Creator. The plants, the animals, the water, the air to breathe, each other, our, our survival is guaranteed by this first set of gifts. In addition, oh, I'm not sure what happened there. There we go. And so in addition, the second set of gifts are metaphysical in nature. Um, there's two sets of laws that we are given by the Creator. Natural law, which the Cree elders tell us that, that it, those are the irrefutable laws of nature. Where we come from, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I know that's maybe a little bit different. But we, we, can't, we can't challenge that. We can't refute those laws of nature. As importantly, they gave us this teaching of Wachotuin. And Wachotuin is the doctrine of relationships. They are the rules that are in place that guide my interaction with everything alive. There are specific rules that I must follow. And in, in that spiral, the rules are what provide the healthy boundaries and keep that spiral up whole and healthy and beautiful. Wachotum is grounded in very specific values that the Cree people have, and they're important to the Cree. It's our responsibility. There they are. It's our responsibility to ensure that all of our relationships are informed by those uh, values that we were taught. So this is the ideal. This is what the, those elders were teaching us. Every morning we wake up and we say, this is what we're going to do. By nine o'clock in the morning, we failed miserably. But every day we wake up and say, this is what we are working towards. And so what happened? Um, we spent a lot of time looking at pieces of legislation, looking at our history, and trying to, uh, through that understanding, understand what is going on with our clients today. It's also true that in Canada today, there are more resilient, healthy, beautiful Aboriginal families raising beautiful children than ever before since contract, contact. It's true that we have a burgeoning Aboriginal middle class. We have more doctors, lawyers, crane operators, welders, accountants who are Indigenous than ever before. One of our Grand Chiefs was speaking uh, and he said when he was a child on Saguin First Nation in the 60s, there were 10 Indigenous people across Canada in post-secondary institutions. That's it. Today there are 30,000. That's a hopeful statistic. Things are changing. Um, there's, a, there's this renaissance going on. But when we're talking about our clients, when we're talking about the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the child welfare system, in the justice system, in the correctional system, we need to understand what happened. How is it that we're at this place in this period of time? There's a book that was written by um, one of our public thinkers in Canada, Jonathan Ralston Saul, 
And he said that the nature of the dialogue between first people and settlers at the beginning was one of peaceful coexistence. It was there in relationship, it wasn't perfect, but because everybody needed to survive, there was a relationship being built. But when it came to be an idea of nation building, of land ownership, it became expedient on behalf of the government to put propaganda out to the settlers as they were coming across. They said that Aboriginal people or First Nations people were primitive, heathen, childlike, and unable to take care of themselves and savage. These were purposeful pieces of information that were shared with settlers to facilitate land ownership, to facilitate the creation of the reserve system, to facilitate the moving of the First Nations people out of the way for the purposes of economic development. And so the elders, when they were teaching us about this and what happened and the impact of colonization, they said there's no room for guilt and blame at this time in our history. We can't do that. Guilt and blame are not gonna get us anywhere. So we have to all work together. And so in my mind, that was a hard message because when you hear this stuff, we get really angry. But in, our, in the way that I organized it in our head and when we were talking about this, we said that, you know, we thought, you know, these settlers were all coming across. And they were coming across from Europe. They had a very different worldview than what was going on, on, you know, in Canada or Turtle Island at that time. And when the settlers came and they heard these messages, they were unable to see that there was this beautiful interconnected worldview here at the time or there at the time of contact. There was a philosophy that came from that worldview that was as rigorous as any philosophy in Europe at that time. There was a science that came from that philosophy, a way of knowing the world and seeing the world around us that was as rigorous as any scientific um, expression at that time in history. And there was a pedagogy of way of teaching that science and teaching that philosophy intact at that time. But because of the differences between the peoples, it was hard to see, it was unrecognizable. They really couldn't see each other. And so, um, do you want to tell the story of, of um, tree signing? and how that illustrates that, yeah? So many times we've been asked to explain the treaty signing and, uh, you know, it, and this is a good example of it. Um, to the government, uh, the British government at the time, the recognition of treaties was really to sign a legal binding contract. Um, First Nations leaders at the time had very little understanding of what that legal binding contract meant. And to the First Nations leaders, the signing of the paper really meant little to them. What was important to them was a, an agreement that was being undertaken under the pipe. Um, because the pipe ceremony was the third party witness, the creator. So recognizing when the pipe is held like this, it's bringing the creator down to make sure that this is healthy, that it, in the right relationship, and it's done in a way that's respectful, and that will then be honored. So there was two distinct thinkings, and no fault to either party. We like to sit back and look and try to find blame, but reality is, um, from a First Nations worldview, they fully understand understood at the time that settlers and the government representatives didn't understand this pipe teaching. Just as the British knew full well that the First Nations leaders didn't understand the signing of the agreement. Yet they both went ahead with this agreement. And so when we look back in history and acknowledge the problems we're having right now with the treaties and the misrepresentation and the, of honoring those treaties, it, it really goes back to that point. Um, and, and that is recognizing on both sides, but importantly, recognizing that there wasn't, at that time, that there was in fact a vibrant indigenous society with some set of rules that guided those things. Mm -hmm. And so it could be said that the First Nations uh, were trying to create a wahotoan with the settlers. They're trying to create a sacred relationship. They were trying to create a relationship where they could be bound together with the settlers and move forward being full participants in whatever was gonna happen on this land didn't quite happen that way. The government at the time went away and started to make their own rules. And there, uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time mapping three specific areas of where these, what this legislation has done. Um, the government has formally, in 1850, formally took away First Nations people to determine their own membership, something quite different than here. First Nations people became treaty Indians, non-status Indians, Métis, 
there are so many legal definitions that divide us. Um, there were two acts that were passed in the 1800s that entrenched the inferior status of the Indian identity into our law and our Canadian social fabric. Those two pieces of legislation never went away. They got wrapped up into something called the Indian Act that still exists today. And anybody who's read the Indian Act can see that that inferior status of the Indian identity still exists. Their assimilation policies still exist in Canada. Um, they were attacks on the Indian identity. And um, for the most part, that hasn't gone away. They were also a moral justification for colonization. Um, this started in 1763. The Indian Act still exists. It's still being amended. We're still dealing with this colonial, the last bastion of assimilation and colonialism in Canada. And so until we start unpacking that, until we start kind of looking at that, we're not going to actually resolve the issues that we have. Um, the residential school system has been well studied. In 1920, when Duncan, 1920, my dad was born in 1934. He's still alive. 1920 is in our recent history. When Duncan Scott stood up in the House of Commons and said, we want the entire possession of every Indian child. What he was talking about is that every Indian child from the age of seven to 15 must go to residential schools. And although residential schools had opened 50 years prior, in 1920, it was absolutely a game changer because every child had to go. So um, it was used to kill the Indian and the child with three ways. Separate children from language, culture, spirituality, and family. Assimilate them into European values and lifestyle. And, and um, socialize them and assimilate them through enfranchisement. And it was the most powerful instrument of colonization when the RCMP came for the children. Everything else that happened until then, there was a lot of passive resistance by leaders. It was hard to make those laws happen, but the residential school policy was a game changer. And we know that they were mismanaged, underfunded, overcrowded, staff acted without consequence. There was a high death rate of children in those um, schools. We now know that at least 6,000 children died. But in 1920, the death rates in the residential school system was so high that the Indian agents stopped counting. So we'll really never know how many children died in those residential schools. Um, we know that um, there was very poor nutrition. They were fed very poorly. There's a lot of documentation um, that uh, children were used for child labor. So there would be farm animals. For example, there'd be cows in the back. The children would be made to milk them. They would make butter and sell it to the, the nearby towns. And the, the poorest of the milk the skim milk would be fed to the children. And so they were very poorly nourished and it caused a lot of dynamics within, um, within the residential schools between children. And we know that staff mandated or condoned severe corporal punishment. As importantly, when children, if they got to go home, because some didn't, but when they did go home, they were um, now very suspicious of these ceremonies that would otherwise have bound them to their family. They were beaten for speaking their language. They were told that First Nations culture, language, and spirituality was heathen, that if they practiced it, they were going to go to the devil. And so when they went home, they didn't want to participate in these ceremonies. And the role of those ceremonies, that was the pedagogy. Most of the Wahotuan was taught through ceremony. And so those rituals and customs that would have otherwise bound children to their community, helped them to understand who they were, would have given them an idea of a, a very healthy Aboriginal identity where, where um, there was a, a cultural gap being formed. And so Indian agents, even in 1913, were writing that children returning home didn't feel a part of mainstream culture, but they were now not feeling a part of their home communities either, and they were left stranded in the middle. We also know that there were high incident rates of physical and sexual abuse in those um, schools. And recently, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, released an important report in June, and they told us that 37 well, almost 38,000 claims for injuries at the residential schools have been made, and 30,000 of them have been settled. There's ample proof that this was going on in the residential schools. And so and then we know with child welfare policies, um, in 1950s, there was almost no children in the child welfare caseloads. They were all at residential schools. By the 60s, children were being, were being mass apprehended. It was the next wave of assimilation. The government said if the residential schools aren't going to work, we're going to place children in white families and the white families are going to be the next level of assimilation and so in the 60s there are many incidences of child welfare driving buses onto reserves and apprehending children by the bus load we refer to that now as the 60s scoop and so 
both in, in residential schools and foster care, it was a hostile environment. Children didn't learn positive European values, and they weren't learning their Wachotuan. They weren't learning Aboriginal values. They were raised in environments that didn't have nurturing parents or adults. Um, they never learned to firm, form trusting relationships with adults. And so now I'm making this case for the intergenerational trauma that happened. So the parents who grew up in foster care or grew up in residential schools passed on identity confusion and that inability to form trusting relationships to their children. And, and so what you have in that spiral, if you take the Wahotuan out, if you take the rules out, we still remain connected. We still have family relationships, but we're not operating with healthy rules. Those healthy sacred boundaries are transgressed. The Wakotun comes out and the spiral collapses on itself. It's our argument that the fact that there's still ceremony to reclaim, that there are still elders with teachings is because of our interconnectedness. We've never lost our blood connections. We still, by the, the, the blood that runs in our body calls us back to those teachings. But when we don't learn our Wachotuan, when we don't have healthy rules that guide our relationships, this is what it feels like. For some of us working in our communities, it's chaotic. It doesn't make sense, it's unpredictable. There's things going on all over the place. Okay. The slinky, right, you know? So when you have your, uh, when your child has a slinky, right, you know what happens when they get all tangled, it's in the bottom of the toy box and they come to you, you know, mom, can you fix this? And your first reaction is no, let's just buy another one. You know, this is too much of a mess. But for those of us working in our communities, we can throw that away. These are our families, these are our community members. And they all, go ahead. And like a, like a broken slinky, we've got education pulling on one piece of it, trying to fix it. We've got child welfare trying to fix another piece of it the justice system and the slinky just keeps getting tangled worse. And that's what we found is happening to a lot of our clients. And the elders tell us that the only way this is going to be resolved is if we all work together, all of us, non-Aboriginal, Aboriginal people. This is not the Indian problem. This isn't an Aboriginal problem. This is a Canadian problem. This is an all-in effort that we all have to be operating from a Wachotun, from a sacred relationship with each other. We have to be working together if we're going to fix this. And so that's historic trauma. It's a word that's being used all over the globe now. It calls to mind the intergenerational transmission of traumatic and trauma-informed behaviors. It's cumulative over the lifespan of individuals and across generations. In Canada, it includes residential school survivors, generations of children who were scooped up and put in the child welfare system, and the Aboriginal people that we work with today who carry the trauma of loss, assimilation, and ethnocide. And so, quickly, when we look at our historic trauma experience, we spent a lot of time saying, okay, well, if that happened in the past, or this is what colonial policy is, how does it manifest today? What are the behaviors we see in our clients that are a result of this colonial past? And so the first one that uh, we were looking at is the colonized psyche, because it's not just non-Aboriginal people who carry all of these negative stereotypes about Aboriginal um, culture, spirituality, science, it's Aboriginal people as well. It's the internalization of those negative stereotypes about Aboriginal culture. And it's left many Aboriginal people feeling neither a part of the Canadian society nor comfortable with their Aboriginal identity. The political and social domination, the difficulty for individuals, families, and nations to self-determine. At the time of the residential schools, the old people would tell children when the RCMP would come, go and hide in the bush. Go run and hide in the bush. And in the 60s, when the school buses were coming, they're apprehending children. The old people were still telling children, go we'll run and hide in the bush. We have friends who spent days in the bush hiding from child welfare, scared that they were going to be taken from their families. About six months ago, we had a client when child, fair, child welfare knocked on her door. She scooped up her babies and she ran down the back alley. This is a historic trauma response. It's the absolute fear of anybody who has any authority or power or perceived power over you. It includes fears of doctors, lawyers, crown prosecutors, school principals, um, uh, legal aid lawyers, like anybody who has, a, who has any perceived power, there's a real fear. And there's two sides to the fear coin. The first one is the client that sits in our office like this, really small, really hunched over, no eye contact, doesn't really want to engage, very, very fearful. But the flip side of that is the fight. If that's the flight, 
there's the fight response and we've all worked with clients like that too where they're going to come out swinging and they're going to hurt you before you can hurt them and that that absolute anger fear and rage that we deal with those are that's a historic trauma response and we know that the residential school phenomenon introduced pervasive intergenerational cycles of family violence in some Aboriginal families, not all, but definitely some of our families are dealing with this. And when children grow up in families where this um, violence is going on, and it's going on in the neighbors over there, and it's going on in the neighbors over there, and their cousins over there have the same experience, it becomes normalized. And so they, this is just the way it is. And children grow up thinking that that violence is normal. And so, if we were going to think about a profile of our Aboriginal clients, many of them have been raised in environments where there's no opportunities to form trusting relationships with caring adults. They've not learned positive moral or social codes, neither like mainstream Canadian nor Aboriginal. They've experienced systemic racism, chronic underemployment, they live in poverty, disenfranchisement, and they're disconnected from Canadian and Aboriginal culture. And so what this has caused and what the takeaway for this is the intergenerational transmission of hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness. Often when I hear um, people, when I do presentations like this, I hear people talking about their clients shooting themselves in the foot. That somehow their Aboriginal clients don't have the intellectual capacity to make a good decision for themselves. Or that they just don't care. Oh, they just don't care. Look at, look at those Aboriginal people. And I would argue that this is a learned hopelessness and a learned helplessness and an inability to see choices in their life. And the other part of that is that we have a lot of clients who carry a deep sense of shame for being Aboriginal, that they have no connection to healthy Aboriginal culture, have never learned it, especially those that grow up in the inner city. Um, everything they've learned has been through Hollywood movies. And they have internalized these negative stereotypes, very shameful of who they are. So I'm going to switch that over to you about NCSA and our clients. So I, I think what I want to talk about a little bit about is how we, we took this model and really made change in, in the organization. And the first was recognizing that if we understand how intergenerational trauma is affecting our people, how do we create healthy, safe space for clients to, to uh, receive wellness treatment healing and so we went back to our elders and we introduced took back the information they shared uh, shared with us and said is this is this what we heard because this is what we think is the model that will guide who we are as an organization from governance um, right through the service delivery and once that was adopted and accepted we we then introduced that throughout the organization and part of that commitment was in the introduction was making sure that we trained our staff uh, and we did the healing work with our staff so that our staff are healthy enough to take their clients down the same road as healing unhealthy staff very difficult to, to carry a client through a healing journey or support them through it so as an organization we implemented this model um, of resilience and we'll go to the model and we decided that in order for us to untangle this mess in our communities and with each of our clients we really needed to uh, have a across the whole organization a belief a buy-in in this and so it, it, it didn't just apply to our serving our clients it was how we interacted with each other as an organization. It was looking at how we recruit staff. So we recruit people that are committed to this journey with us. We then went throughout the whole organization and all of our policy area, throughout our accreditation process, included the language in our contractual agreements with government, and started to use this model as the guiding principles for everything we do in the organization. And what we could do maybe is talk a little bit about the model, and then as we go along, we'll talk a little bit about how it applies to the service delivery. Yeah. So the first, um, the first part of this model is reclaiming our interconnected worldview with rules and our relationship. And now, as Alan said, that's including that includes 
bringing those that Wahotuan back into our agency, um, transforming our, our agency to include these traditional teachings that the elders gave us. And it's, it's much harder than it sounds. Uh, it's about walking our talk. It's about treating each other with kindness, caring, respect, uh, about truly um, building back healthy and respectful relationships, first of all, within NCSA, having all of those values guide our interactions with our clients. And we had an elder say to us the other day, so how far does this Wahotuan go? And, we, uh, and he said, "If I, you know, how do we uh, build caring relationships with our clients respectful relationships with our clients. How do we ever stop having them as our clients? How, where does Wakotuan end? And it really is about trying to um, emulate these ideas. It's not that they are our clients. We have a relationship with them. We need to take them where they're at, at the time, help them with what's going on in front of them, and help them to um, reclaim their interconnectedness, connect them back to ceremony if that's what they want to do. We're not into conversion, by the way. It's okay to be an Aboriginal person who's Christian. We have Baha'i people. We have agnostic. We have atheist. All of that is fine and okay. There's a million ways to be an Aboriginal person. What we're interested in is having people have real, authentic experiences with the traditional teachings, to, um, to see that they exist, to have experiences with them, and to um, reconcile all of those negative stereotypes that pervade the Canadian social fabric about who Aboriginal people are. Choosing to be Christian or, or, or agnostic or atheist is fine. But if, you can't, if we don't get to the, to the true teachings and dealing with these negative stereotypes, at least internally and with our own clients, how is, this, how is our society ever going to change? So we went with the late Dr. Harold Cardinal referred to it as, uh, in, in our language, it's Owena Piano. In, in simple interpretation, it's who are we, but in the detail of the interpretation, it's understanding who we are in relationship to the Wakoto and the interconnected worldview. So, you know, in, in going through this change wasn't an easy one, as Patty talked about. We had to literally go back and look at all the trauma responses and uh, chaos within relationships, even within the own, our own organization going through major management restructuring, dealing with lateral violence and implementing policies of zero tolerance for lateral violence in the organization, making it mandatory that all managers, our board of directors, all the way through the organization, understood the lateral violence policies, practice good behavior within the organization. And, and we have virtually eliminated conflict within the organization because of that. Um, and, and I think that that was the self-determining side of the agency was making a decision that we had to show good leadership. Uh, and without good leadership, we were not gonna change the organization. But we're not a bunch of Gandhis either, we're not. We're imperfect human beings, being imperfect every single day. What we're interested in is helping people to um, see where they're at in their own healing journey, um, see how their own behavior is informed by trauma and offer them alternatives. And we start with our staff first. And, and certainly we do that with our clients. But I'm always careful to, uh, to make sure we're, we're, people know we're, yeah, we're, we're human. And the second, the second part of this uh, model is about the reconciliation of damaged relationships. You know, when we talk about reconciliation in Canada, there's this larger government, sovereign nation to government discourse that goes on. It's very theoretical and it's very top level. And that's great. For us, what it, reconciliation has to be on the ground every day, every single action we take as workers in the field, as, as managers, as the CEO, as the board of directors, has to be from the perspective of we have to fix our relationships. It goes back to that elder's teaching that everything that we do must maintain, build, or strengthen relationships in the work that we do. And then the belief is what Alan said, everything that is going to fix our problem comes from us. That we are not looking to mainstream Canada for answers for anything. That we believe that um, there's ways of marrying Western and traditional Aboriginal um, uh, solutions that we can find common ground. And anytime we can find common ground between the two approaches, that's when we can get government, that's when we can get industry, and that's when we can get Aboriginal people on the same page moving forward. We're very invested in common ground. And it's really not that hard to find if all parties want to find it. And so that is 
those are the ideas or that's how we are going to get our spiral untangled whole and healthy and they, it all comes from our elders teachings that we're ending it? I think that's a 40 minutes yes thank you Patty and Alan's role in this notion of leadership for good. And I think the presentation has just shown how broad the embrace of good is in the work that they are doing in their communities in Canada. Can you please thank Dr. Patty Labokane and Dr. Alan Benson one more time? <laughs> Now's the opportunity for you to pepper them with complex, difficult, and interesting questions. <laughs> first one, oh, Sheree first, and then perhaps there. <coughs> churches did. The churches ran the residential schools, and they, um, they were very involved. The, the yeah. Part of the real reconciliation work around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was around the, the settlement, legal settlement with the churches, but more importantly was around the churches acknowledging their responsibility. Um, and, and the churches have played a, a big role uh, throughout Canada in working really hard to try to improve um, and repair that relationship with our people. Uh, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge. There are some of the churches, like the Catholic Church, in some instances where priests have incorporated cultural ceremony into the church, and it's been accepted. There are other Catholic Church leaders, like uh, bishops, who have refused to allow uh, an elder uh, to do a prayer at a funeral or bring any kind of traditional ceremony. So there are ongoing battles around the reconciliation with the churches, for sure. But it's also true that every church except the Catholic Church the Anglican United, I think, and the Evangelical, and, yeah, Evangelical, have made formal apologies to the First Nations people, have talked about um, how wrong it was to discount their spirituality, and have actually created funds or actions on behalf of the church to right the wrong. The Catholic Church remains the only one who refuses to apologize, I think because their leader is someplace, you know, in Europe. And there, that, that hasn't happened, but for the most part, the churches are a part of the reconciliation process, but it's not perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Most of our ideas from lateral violence, while we introduced it to our organization, most of our ideas actually came from working with McGuda and other people in Australia because the idea of lateral violence was expanded on here. So basically, took what we started as a small project in Canada and ran with it here. And our experience in exchange and working with Mick and, and many other people across the country around uh, lateral violence has taught us a couple of important things. One is you can't stop talking about it. Two, that you have to start influencing policy and having it mandatory as part of the workplace policy. And, and three, to create a safe place for people to have the conversation and training and having that, uh, creating that safe space is one of the most important things. Uh, I was, I'm not even sure what year that was, it was the inaugural health awards 
uh, Aboriginal Health Wards at the Sheraton here on Pitt Street, or Elizabeth, I can't remember. Um, and I remember doing the Ladder of Arms workshop, and one of the Aboriginal women, the leaders from one of the areas, stood up and said, very emotional, uh, and said, I take full responsibility for my family in lateral violence. And from this day forward, I'm going to make a change and make a difference. And she continued to email and communicate with me because to her, what was most important, she changed her immediate family. And uh, that was really touching for me because it was back home. We don't have those conversations like that. It's where we really had to be in, in people's face about it. And if anybody knows me, you'll know that I, I'm in, in my own people's face all the time. So uh, <laughs> it's a little different. When you're working in somebody else's country, you're able to have a, a whole different dialogue around it, isn't it? And I would say that lateral violence uh, in particular is a human condition. It's not owned by Indigenous people. And so often uh, we can look at lateral violence as being, being grounded in some pretty negative, racist, misunderstandings or assumptions and so we can um, I think from that perspective what Alan says about safe space we can do lateral violence training cross-culturally if this if we create safe space and have people um, explore this idea without feeling guilt shame and blame because the moment we make we uh, create a space where people feel defensive it, it just can't happen but that safety uh, inclusivity is, is important and, and I guess using lateral violence as an opportunity to deal with that, what, what it actually is, and not using it as an excuse. Because right. in other cases, lateral violence is used as an excuse. Oh, my boss is making me accountable, so they're being lateral violent, as an example. And, and that often happens in the workplace. Nick? Um, yeah, Alan, uh, I think Shane, Shane um, and I and about eight other people went to see Alan's uh, organization launched the domestic uh, electoral violence um, program in, within the organization. I think, Shane, it's safe to say 10 of us walked out and have really never been the same again. We, I, I go back to Rockhampton and they think this strange Mick Good has turned up, you know, he's, he's talking about everyone. What do you want to fight for about that, you know? Um, but it, and, and Alan and Patty have sort of helped me on that journey. It, it's actually made me different. Um, um, but um, uh, we created two rules here about lateral violence, the golden rules we call them. We said, you only got control over your own behaviour. That's the only thing you can control. And the, and, the, and the most important, another important one is you can't be laterally violent in your response to lateral violence. And that's always a temptation to do. Now, otherwise, my 2011 social justice and the native title report actually explored lateral violence um, beautifully, I think. And, uh, uh, and as I say in that, I had to re really think long and hard about exposing lateral violence uh, in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities because um, there was a risk that we're just going to tag our mob with another dysfunction. But the risk, and I talked to Alan about it, the risk of not doing anything was even greater. And, and I've got to say, what I, I was there when that woman stood up in this thing and said, basically, I'm the most laterally violent person I know. Um, and took responsibility. Uh, out, out of the 10 odd thousand people I've spoken to in my time in this job, I've only found one that challenged me on it. So the appetite in our community to fix this is really great. And I think you'll find the same in the department. We have time for one more question. Sorry. I am very much involved in, my name is Minna Singh Batra. I'm very much involved in interfaith networks and uh, our membership has about 12 faiths uh, represented mm -hmm. and we were very keen to have an aborigine to join us so that we learn these first people of Australia's views of their faith and I talked to a couple of them one of them came to one of the meetings and they said, well, we are all Christians, and uh, you have enough Christians here. And I said, but Aboriginal spirituality has its own values. And we want to learn that, because I had read a couple of books about it. And, uh, but we didn't succeed. Hmm. 
in the uh, in that matter. And I have another question for Mr. Tom Karma. Can I ask you, where does where do the Aboriginal Australians stand compared to what we have learned about Canadian Aboriginals? Well, Tom's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Mick will say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think um, it would be true to say that it's different for different things. The work on lateral violence is significantly more advanced in Canada than it is in Australia. The work on trauma-informed practice is very well developed in Canada and developing in Australia, starting to develop in Australia. The um, the important element that I think that, that, that from both Patty and Alan's um, presentation today, this notion of self being at the centre of change mm -hmm. is something that is increasingly prominent in our communities. Could be, could be much better. But, you know, when I remember in the 70s when I was working in Redfern, and Cherie was running around then too, um, the notion of Aboriginal identity was you're black, drunk and dirty. Now it's not. We're proud, confident and engaged. You know, um, so there are diff we're seeing some change. Um, and the beauty about um, those differences is that it reinforces the point that Alan and Patty have made, and I think is common in, tradition in, in Aboriginal communities, is that relationships are important. They support each other. They allow us to be our better selves. And it allows us to share. Um, and it's a good point for us to finish, I think, so you've got about 30 seconds. I'm speaking with the Australian Law Council um, tomorrow afternoon on reducing the number of Aboriginal men in incarceration. One of the pieces of discussion will be around around that very issue. Of, uh, and, and, and so for us, um, it's absolutely one of our biggest priorities is that we as men in our community have to show leadership. We have to show healthy leadership and we have to teach our young men of leadership and within all of that structure um, unfortunately for us I, I make this comment all the time the Canadian government um, we have to give them credit for helping our, us heal our people because it's through jails that we're healing them which is a pretty sad state mm -hmm. but that's the reality but just very quickly um, the Canadian government up until a couple of weeks ago when we changed governments but for 10 years they would have had I know we're pretty excited <laughs> um, so the uh, they would have had us believe that public safety is only achieved by locking people up that by removing people and throwing them in jail um, that's the only way we can maintain public safety and it's our position that public safety safety truly comes from healing practice that if when we have men particularly and women in jail that if we can engage them in a healing journey that can last throughout their life, that that truly is the only way public safety can be guaranteed, is if we address core issues of the people that are in jail. And I think now we have a government that might be a little bit more responsive to that idea. And there's your color. You know, I, I, I don't see it as an issue of color uh, back home. The, you know, we have uh, over-representation of Aboriginal people um, in our systems, but I think the larger issue is that we, as Aboriginal people in Canada, haven't taken that responsibility on seriously enough, so it, we're sort of taking the shift away from government and saying it's our responsibility to show leadership on that issue. There is systemic discrimination. There's no question yeah, there's discrimination, absolutely. but it's because we tolerate it and we allow it within our system. And the judges tomorrow and some of the scholars, legal scholars, are speaking about that issue and have addressed that from their perspective. Um, I, 
Well, we run our own healing lodges for, for federal inmates, uh, mm -hmm. and we're very successful, and I believe it's because we're doing that. <laughs> Please. I get the, the privilege of offering a small gift in thanks um, for sharing with us today. Um, yeah. um, th there are many people we should thank, not the least Paddy and Alan, but also Mick as Commissioner here in the Australian Human Rights Commission. Leadership for good we have in people here as well. Mick is someone who stands up for us every day. Patty and Alan stand up for their families and communities every day. And the thing that, um, for me at least, I take away from today is an incredible hopefulness. And my dad used to steal sayings from everywhere and he had this one saying that said, they who have hope have everything. And if we walk away today hopeful in ourselves, we might help heal ourselves and we might help influence leadership for good. Thank you all for coming. Can you please thank our guests one more time?